Welcome to the legal series on down round financing with Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs United. We unite the Stanford startup community in innovation centers across the country beyond California with regular remote programming. I'm Sheila Pruga, president of the group, managing partner of Prime Row Ventures and a Stanford computer science alumna. We're delighted to welcome Sale Kwan, a partner at Cooley LLP, to lead this legal series. Over to you, Sale. It's always a, a pleasure to do this to this exciting and intelligent group of people. And, and thanks again for having me. To give a little bit of background about, about the firm and myself, I'm a partner in the Emerging Companies and Venture Capital Group of Cooley. I'm based in Palo Alto. And uh, Cooley is a little over 100 years old, and is started in San Francisco, and is best known for the go-to firm uh, for all things that are emerging companies and venture capital matters. I've been personally doing this for over 15 years. I, I call myself an ECVC practitioner. And what that means is most of my time, I work with founders to get their entities off the ground and raise capital and do all kinds of interesting transactions until the liquidity event. So I essentially advise companies throughout their full life cycle. Minority portion of my practice is also to work with venture capital investors, advising them uh, when they want to put money in, you know, quality companies based in the U.S. Note that Cooley LLP is not a financial or investment advisor, and this presentation is only intended to cover a general and non-exhaustive overview of the covered topics and does not, is not intended to constitute legal advice in your particular situation. But if you need to get legal advice or other advice, you need to consult with your own uh, advisors. Before we begin on the down round uh, presentation, I thought it would be helpful to go over a few highlights relating to the current venture market scene. I would start uh, saying that deal activities are down from 2021, but uh, and even from early 22, but it's still holding up and actually continuing the upward trajectory if you write off 2021. So for the last 10 years, venture deal activities have been on the rise every year. And we kind of went crazy in 2021 and it came down this year, but um, up from 2020. And in, in terms of um, how the market downturn that we're experiencing at this time where volatility is impacting VC, um, get, uh, as you can imagine, the farther you are from the public stock market, the less you are impacted. So the farthest corner is these VC funds that are trying to raise money from their LPs. And in fact, at Q3, they're already at the full 2021 level. So they're really doing well uh, in terms of fundraising. But once, one thing that is noticeable is that most of the funds are going to these billion dollar plus mega funds. And actually the number of funds that are being formed is slight. So this is a, a bit of a challenge for uh, first time fund managers or emerging uh, funds. And then you get a little bit closer to the, the public stock market is early stage companies. So these are kind of companies that uh, angel investors invest or, or early stage investors invest. Um, early stage deal size and valuation are holding firm even compared to 2021 and actually are trending up. And the, the next one is the late stage uh, companies, which is essentially very close to the public market because sometimes those are pre-IPO companies trying to go public and their deal size and valuation are down from 2021 to no one's surprise. And although like VC market is suffering this downturn in some respect, um, some foreign and corporate investors find this as an opportunity to access um, hot startups that they couldn't access when the you know, venture economy was much better. In terms of geographic, uh, geographic uh, breakdown, uh, the Bay Area still is the biggest market followed by New York, LA, and Boston. Um, what's interesting is the bigger the market, the, the, the bigger deals are happening and, and deals are happening at a higher valuation. So what that means is the rest of the U.S., um, those are essentially smaller deals at lower valuations. And the biggest deals are happening in, here in Silicon Valley at the highest valuation in general. Noteworthy thing about this downturn is uh, its impact on exits. So as you can imagine, uh, two primary ways uh, companies experience exits is uh, essentially, uh, where a liquidity event is either going public through an IPO or uh, getting sold, either to like strategic corporate buyers or PE or other buyout firms. Exits are down by 50% um, compared to 2021, and largely due to IPOs essentially not happening as often. So exit value is also down. It's five-year low. Interestingly, exit value when it comes to acquisitions or a sale uh, is still high. It's just the um, you know IPO sale to buyout firms are happening at a lower valuation. Um, another interesting thing to point out is companies are being acquired at an earlier stage. 
So there could be a number of reasons. Uh, maybe they find earlier uh, of a bargain, but at the same time, uh, when we say early stage, we usually look at the stage, whether it's series C, A, or B. But sometimes like people want to call, you know, let's not call this round series B. Instead, we'll call series A1, in which case you may look younger and more earlier stage, but in fact, like you are not actually an earlier stage company. So I don't know uh, what to make of it. Uh, the general trend is companies are being picked up at an earlier stage. Last, because of the capital market suffering the downturn, uh, terms are becoming more and more investor favorable. And what investors like to call it is uh, structure. So they, when you talk to them, they say, oh, I want to see some structure in this finance. And so this presentation is mostly um, to give you better visibility as to what they mean when they talk about, so quote unquote, structure. So before we move on to the next um, segment, I, I think, Sheila, we, we can do a little poll. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm going to launch a poll here. So if everyone in the audience could indicate, have you experienced a down round this year? We'd appreciate to see your uh, experience. So it looks and I'll like, let um, you share the results. Okay, so I, I see about 10% of the attendees experience some type of down round versus 90% not having seen it, which doesn't surprise me because down rounds, when you think about it, is in comparison to uh, an earlier round. So if you're an early stage investor, you probably participate in the first you know, uh, convertible or equity round. So you don't have any comparison point. So in fact, down rounds are more common in late stage and you know uh, later stage companies because, for example, if you raised money last year, then chances are you got a pretty favorable valuation. And if you're uh, in a position you have to raise again this year, uh, that may result in a down round compared to the, the last year's round. So when you're thinking about what the considerations relating to a down round, you can kind of put them in two different buckets. I mean, the line isn't all that clear between the two categories, but I would call them like business and legal. In terms of business consideration, and, and I'm going to get into more detail in later slides, but um, you, you can think about the liquidation preference issues, you know, uh, difficulty or challenging circumstances of getting financial support, and also um, challenge relating to incentivizing your management to stay or work hard. From a legal perspective, I, I can cover the you know, basic fiduciary duties and what it means to you know, have a conflict in a situation and how you cleanse it and the importance of the process. So starting with the business concerns, I, I, I think um, most of the attendees here are sophisticated enough to know what the liquidation preference is, but just to kind of, it, the basics is such that when you issue shares and raise money by issuing shares, you sell preferred stock in, in a typical financing. And preferred stock is called preferred stock because it has preferential terms compared to uh, normal common stock. And one of the most important um, you know, preferred terms is liquidation preference. So what in, in normal times, what that means is, okay, if the company is sold, you essentially get your money back first, uh, and then the rest gets distributed to, to common holders. So in, in normal times, the typical term would be non-participating 1x liquidation preference. So what that means is it's not non-participating in the sense that you can't double dip. You have to choose either to get your money back uh, which is where 1x comes from, 1x uh, the amount you put in, or uh, you get your parada portion of the proceeds. Obviously, if your parada portion of the proceeds is bigger, then you would go for the greater consideration. Um, so what that means is if the company is doing well, liquidation preference isn't all that important. So it makes it a downside protection because if the company say sold at a low value, then it would be better to get your money back then yet get a prorata portion of the low consideration amount. In normal times, like company values um, usually exceed liquidation preferences. So let's say the company's valued at 80 million pre, and uh, you, know, you just invested $20 million. Then the company is valued at 100 million post because it's 80 plus 20, and the liquidation preference would be $20 million. So when you think about it, if the company is sold at $100 million, it doesn't make a difference. You get $20 million back. Um, because that's what you own. But if the company is sold for $200 million, then it would be better for you to actually get your parada portion, which would be 20% or $40 million. Uh, 
uh, if the company is sold at $50 million, then your pro rata portion would be only $10 million. So you would want to get your liquidation preference back, which would be equal to $20 million. So that's how a liquidation preference works. Now, in a down round or in, in difficult times in general, um, the liquidation preference may be larger than the value of the company. Um, so th this is where, and, and I'm talking about the existing liquidation preference. So this is a problem for many reasons. What that means is when the company is sold under the, the a value that is lower than the liquidation preference, then common stockholders um, really don't get anything out of it. So when you think about employees holding common stock, they don't have as much incentive to work hard to raise the value of the company because you're so much underwater. In some situations, it would be desirable for the company to get the liquidation preference down. And there are many ways to do it. Then you may ask, so I'm entitled to $10 million liquidation preference. Why would I ever agree to lower my liquidation preference? So that's why that you have to think of it uh, as it, in, in your circumstances. So let's say a new investor comes in and says, oh, you have uh, a, a too great amount of liquidation preference. So I'm going to cut a check here, but uh, you need to agree to participate and reduce your liquidation preference. So that is sort of one way to recapitalize the company. Um, the, the part about you have to participate is um, often called a pay to play. And pay to play can take different shape or forms, but uh, one typical formulation would be, let's say you own 20% of the company, and then we're doing a $10 million round. In, in that case, like you got to do your pro rata, the new investor would say. So if you um, do your pro rata, meaning $2 million of 10 million should come from you. If you don't invest $2 million, whatever liquidation preference that you had in the existing preferred stock uh, will, be con will be gone or eliminated. And the way to affect it is by converting your existing preferred shares into common shares. Because common shares, as I said, doesn't have liquidation preference. Um, and another way to navigate this one from a fundraising perspective is to say, hey, new investor, I know we have a lot of liquidation preference, so that's a problem, but we'll give you a super preference. So what that means is, although the existing investors are entitled to 1x liquidation preference, we'll give you 2x liquidation preference. And sometimes we'll treat you senior to the existing holders of preferred stock so that if there's a sale, then you get your money back before one of us gets ours. And also you get $2 back for a dollar invested. So that's what it means to have super liquidation preference and seniority. Um, so that's something you have to, you may, may see in a down round situation. So this is again, the theme of how to encourage participation in a round. So this is where the company is suffering a little bit and having a um, tough time raising money. So how do you encourage people to cut a check for your company? And um, there are two different approaches. One is the carrots and the stick. Uh, so carrots is essentially, oh, if you invest, we're going to give you some benefit. So ratchet prior money, uh, this is, um, you know, under any dilution conversion price adjustment, there is a kind that is called full ratchet. So essentially what that means is, let's say you bought your existing preferred stock at a dollar per share. And now uh, this is a down round at 50 cents per share. So you're disappointed. But what full ratchet would do is uh, if you participate, then we'll essentially give your money back. And then you'll be investing the same amount at the current price. So that's what the ratchet does effectively. So before you had uh, this preferred stock, that uh, could convert into uh, common stock in, on a one-to-one -one basis. Now, uh, because you got your money back and reinvested at the half the value, the same number of shares, uh, you would have the same number of shares, but it would convert into like two shares of common. So that, that's how you get the benefit of it. And, and that's what it means to give a full ratchet any dilution protection. Now, um, full ratchet is essentially just um, ownership um, benefit and something better is pull up. So uh, the new, new round would not only have a lower price, the new round would have other sweeteners too, like senior or 2x liquidation preference. So another sweetener could be if you participate in this round uh, on your parada or more, then your existing shares, let's say series A, will be exchanged for the same number of shares of series B. So it not only has the same lower price, 
but it also uh, comes with other benefits that you're giving to uh, the new, new, new investors in this round. And there could be warrant coverage. So this is not only, you're not only buying shares, we would also give you the right to purchase extra shares, which is what warrants are. The other approach is the stick, the stick approach, which is uh, if you don't do your parada, then here are the bad things that can happen to you. So that's essentially the stick approach or the hammer as the slide has it. Uh, so one is, as I said, like a pay to play, uh, which often involves um, loss of liquidation preferences. Um, sometimes uh, it's not just converting your preferred to common. It is converting your preferred to common at an adverse ratio. So let's say you had like five shares of preferred stock. Uh, if you don't do your parada, the, the other investors would say, you would end up with not only common stock, but you would end up with a single share of common stock. So essentially the conversion ratio would be five to one. So uh, that's, that's a stick. And also you may have some existing rights and they would say, if you don't participate in uh, this round on a pro rata basis or some other you know, criteria, uh, you would lose some of those rights or all of those rights, including like board seat, pro rata rights, any dilution protection, so on and so forth. And I briefly touched on uh, this <clears throat> incentive problem uh, before. So what does that mean? Let's say you are raising money at a lower valuation, which is essentially what a down round means. Then uh, for the same amount of money that you want to raise, you have to issue more shares because the purchase price is low. So what that does is that dilutes people more than what is normal, right? So that's excessive dilution. And if you're the CEO that has 10% of the company, and then you expect like, oh, parada, it's going to be like, you know, I would end up with 8%, but because it was a significant down round, I would end up with 3% or something, then that's a problem, right? Because the CEO is now less motivated. So in that case, the solution could be uh, what is called refresher grants. So it's just some extra grants of equity, um, usually in the form of an option grant. Sometimes I have option grants, uh, and option grants are usually priced at a value that is equal to the fair market value of the underlying shares, which is usually common stock, uh, at the time of the grant. So let's say I got an option grant in 2021 when things were good. So I have these options exercisable at a dollar per share. Now, this year, we, we get a new valuation and it says it's 50 cents per share because the company is less valuable in the eyes of the uh, valuation firm. In which case, um, I have this instrument where that gives me the right to acquire shares when I pay a uh, dollar per share. Now, if the fair market value is only 50 cents, then it really doesn't make sense for me to exercise the option. So the option is underwater. Uh, and even if I work my tail off and the value goes up to a dollar, I still haven't done anything for me because um, I still need to pay a dollar. And what I get back is a dollar. Uh, dollar value of stock. So in that case, um, oftentimes the board uh, with the approval of the stockholders as needed would decide to lower the exercise price of the existing option grants. So that's called option repricing. So you can see obviously how that can motivate people. Um, I also briefly touched on this uh, preference problem. So if the company's liquidation preference is becoming disproportionately large compared to the value of the company, um, the, the management who usually hold and employees who usually hold common stock, they wouldn't really see much value in, in their common stock. That's a problem. So one way to address it is, as I discussed briefly, is to reduce liquidation preference. And another way is to essentially find a way to put them on top of the preferred liquidation preference. So that's often called a management carve out. So what management carve out is that if you are participating in this management carve out plan, uh, and let's and it has various parameters. And let's say um, it's uh, up to ten million dollars. In which case, if the company is sold, um, you and the management participants would get up to ten million dollars off the top. And then you trigger the liquidation waterfall and give out liquidation preferences. And if there's any residual value, that would be distributed to common holders. So that's a that's one. Um, make sure that the management it continues to be motivated. And obviously you can imagine investors uh, would have some issue with that because that essentially puts some select common holders on top of them. 
the last thing is because the company is in trouble, they probably don't have cash or want to conserve cash, in which case they often want to reduce salaries across the board or selectively um, and try to offset the lowered salaries with refresher grants that we talked about or uh, promise that you're going to get a lot of money or, or cash bonuses, but only if we raise uh, a, a round of certain par parameters. So that way, you know that when you have to pay these bonuses, you'll have a lot of money raised. So that could be performance bonus. And there's management carve out um, that we talked about. So now here are some of the terms that are considered investor favorable terms in down rounds. Um, so this is what people mean oftentimes when they talk about structure. Um, so before I get into any of these, like um, I, I want to make sure, you know, we kind of level set because these are investor favorable terms compared to terms that you see in normal times. So let's uh, take the first thing, cumulative dividends. So uh, in, in venture, paying dividends is highly unusual. So like one example that is frequently brought up is Amazon. Amazon has never paid dividends. So what are you to pay dividends, right? If you have money to pay dividends, you probably want to use the, the money to grow your business, right? Um, so that's why in ordinary times, what you have is non-cumulative dividends. And what that means is dividends are possible, but they're only paid when the board approves or declares it. Uh, and that almost, that happens very rarely. Cumulative dividends is still like, it's not payable until the board declares it. But one exception is that, you know, it accrues. So it accumulates. So let's say 5% um, cumulative dividend and you invest a dollar. That means uh, your liquidation preference grows by 5% every year. And then when there is a, an exit, like a sale of the company, then your liquidation preference is not the money you put in, but the money that accrued interest on it. So after two years, it may be close to like, I don't know, $1.10, uh, something like that. So your liquidation preference grows. But the, the important thing is that when you are experiencing a successful sale where you choose to get uh, a prorata portion of the proceeds, then cumulative dividends do not translate into extra shares because that's only uh, an addition to the liquidation preference. And I think we already talked about senior or super liquidation preference previously. Participating preferred is another deviation from what is more standard. So what is more standard is non-participating liquidation preference. So what does that mean? Uh, as I said, if you are thinking about 1x non-participating liquidation uh, preferred stock, that means you have to choose either to get your money back or get a pro rata portion, your pro rata portion of the proceeds. Participating preferred is the best of both worlds because the way it works is you get your money back no matter what. And then the rest would be distributed parada, but you participate in that on an as converted basis. So it doubled, you can double there. Um, lots of people would say, oh, that's just too excessive. So they would uh, advocate for a cap. So if you say participating preferred with a three X cap, that means um, you get your liquidation preference back first one X, and then you participate up to additional two X. So your total return is limited at three X if you trigger liquidation preference. So that's your downside, but let's say you're making five times uh, the money you invested, then you wouldn't trigger liquidation preference. You would simply get 5x, which is your pro rata portion. So uh, it's another way you can get your downside protected. Full ratchet is something I essentially covered before, uh, is essentially economically speaking, you are essentially getting your money back and investing the same amount at the current price, which would give you more shares on an as converted basis. So that's another uh, type of structure. Redemption, um, equity investment in general is not redeemable in the sense that if you invest in, in a loan or, or if you lend money to a company, there's usually maturity date. So after a certain date, you can pull the money out. But equity investment is essentially buying part of the company. So it's much harder to get out. So redemption simply means um, after some period of time, you can essentially get your money back, meaning requiring the company to repurchase your shares. Uh, the purchase price can vary. It could be at the price you paid, or it could be the price you paid plus some premium. So that, that is another parameter that you can adjust. One thing to remember about redemption rights is that it, it's not often not very useful um, because uh, there are state laws that say, 
hey, companies, like you can't distribute or repurchase shares unless you're profitable. So the money you can spend to repurchase shares are limited to sometimes what's called retained earnings or uh, surplus. So uh, then why does that make it not very useful is that when when do you need your money back, right? When do you want to exercise redemption rights? That's when the company's not doing well, right? After three years, the company's still there and I, I want to pull my money back. Uh, in that situation, chances are the company probably is not profitable or doesn't have a whole lot of retained earnings or surplus, in which case, um, even if you want to exercise, the state laws would not allow the company to essentially make that distribution. So that's why redemption rights are not very common and it's uh, not very commonly given and it's even less common to see it actually exercised. Warrant coverage is something extra you throw in and it's again, as I, as I said previously, it's a right to acquire shares, but warrant coverage can be negotiated in various ways. Because when you're thinking about a stock option and ask me like, oh, how is a warrant different from a stock option? Uh, stock option is usually priced at the current fair market value of common stock. And um, the, the option is almost always exercisable into common stock. And, and also it's intended to be a, a compensation to your service providers. That's how options are typically used. Uh, warrants are... Um, same concept in the sense that it's a it's an instrument whereby you can acquire some shares at certain price, but those what kind of shares um, would underlie the warrant gets negotiated. It can be common stock and it can be preferred stock, and also price at which you can exercise the warrant is also negotiated. So is it the last four nine eight price or is it the latest preferred stock price? So that gets negotiated. There are a bunch of other things you can negotiate as well. How long is this warrant? Like options are typically good for ten years. Uh, but warrants, it gets negotiated. Sometimes it's only good for three years, and sometimes it's good for 10 years. Um, so obviously, the longer the term, the more beneficial the warrant would be to the warrant holder. Um, the tranche financing is uh, exactly what it says. So in good times, um, it's usually only life sciences companies that see tranche financing. So they would have some milestones and say, instead of me giving you $10 million now, I'm going to give you $5 million today. And then you can call the other half, the, the additional $5 million, when you get disapproved uh, by the FDA or get to the next phase or you, you name it. So that's somewhat common in life sciences, even in normal times, uh, but not in tech. Um, in a down round situation, even in tech, you often see people who want to try to kind of tranche their investments. So tranching, can, you can get creative. It can be like, you know, multiple tranches and what triggers the next tranche could be time or it could be some kind of commercial milestone and you name it. So you can kind of, you see a lot of variations on that. We already talked about pay to play, so I'm gonna skip that one. And uh, it's the convertible notes that I wanted to talk about. So one way to avoid a down round financing is not to raise another price round. So let's say uh, last year you, it was a good year for your company. So your you know, price per share for the last preferred stock financing was $10 per share, let's say. Uh, this year, you need more money. So you need to raise, but then you can, you, you did a market search, a market check and found out uh, the highest valuation that I can get is only $5 per share. So when I do a down round, it's optically not great because now people know, and then once you get like a valuation for nine, a valuation for option purposes, people know that um, you suffered a down round. So one way to kind of defer it, because you, you don't think the current stock market would value your company fairly, is to do a convertible round. So uh, I'm sure you guys know all this. Convertible round uh, involves an instrument uh, whereby you essentially give money, uh, advancing some money, uh, with the promise that the money would be converted into the next round of shares uh, at a at certain discount. So you're not really pricing the company at that time. You're just agreeing on how the discount formula would work. Um, so you can, and, and convertible notes are, can be classified as debt. Uh, it, it, it's, it's usually used by equity investors, investors who are um, intending to make investments for equity, but um, you can call it a loan as well. I mean, there, there are some criteria, but if you call it a loan, what, one feature is, to your ability to secure it. So sometimes you would say, hey, it's, uh, I'm you know, loaning you a million dollars, but it needs to be secured by your assets. And in venture context, usually the value is in its IP. 
so oftentimes IP is included in the collateral, uh, in which case if the loan is defaulted, you can ask the IP or the assets that's included as collateral to be essentially auctioned off and then you get your money back if, if proceeds are sufficient. So that's another you know, downside protection, which is not uh, what you see in normal times. Conversion discount uh, varies. And usually it's like, I, I often see 15 to 25%, I guess, for the most part. So if you, I, you're advancing money to the company and say, next round, uh, you price your company and I'm going to convert my loan into the same you know, shares, but at a 15% or 20% discount. Um, so I get more shares than what I would have gotten if I invest um, as a new money investor at that time. Um, sometimes you uh, see more structure around it. So, okay, the conversion discount would be 10% for the first six months. But then uh, if you don't, you're not successful at raising the conversion round within six months, it grows to 20%, or maybe it grows to 30% after a year. So that's one variation and one way you can motivate the company to go out and raise a price round quickly. Because initially uh, when convertible notes were first used, they weren't meant to be a separate round. They were usually um, meant to bridge the company from now to a near-term financing. So that's why usually the convertible notes have terms ranging from six to 18 months. Uh, that, that's usually what was pretty common. Uh, and no one uh, who invests in convertible note think of it as uh, a loan, really, because do I want to take this amount of risk to get my 6% interest on an annual basis? Uh, that doesn't really work. I mean, it's cost benefit analysis doesn't work. So you have interest because it's a you know technically a, a debt instrument, and and you have a maturity date. But it's very rare for those uh, debt holders to actually call their loan and get repaid because their approach is always to get it converted at a discount. Now, um, when in another kind of structure you can introduce into your convertible note is acquisition premium. So. Uh, this essentially means what happens when I hold a note and the company uh, gets sold. So obviously it's not satisfactory for me to get my money back plus interest. I mean, however long the note was outstanding, I'm sure the interest rate isn't very satisfactory. So uh, in that case, you have two. Uh, another uh, common feature is your right to convert the note at a certain agreed cap. So even whatever the company's valued, you're going to value the company at a certain amount for the purposes of finding the conversion price. So if the company sold at a billion, but your conversion cap is only hundred million dollars, then you would convert your loan into a lot more shares than you would get if your note got converted at a billion dollar valuation. So, but then like there is a situation where, oh, like I, we're not, you know, in that situation where converting uh, is, is all that beneficial. But also, I don't know if I like the interest only as my only return. So in that case, you introduce this concept of acquisition premium, which says, oh, I can call my loan. And when I do it, not, not only I get my principal and interest back, but I get some premium on it. So that premium can range all the way from, you know, 1x uh, through like I've seen like 5x. Uh, so obviously, the acquisition premium gets larger when uh, the, in, the larger the acquisition premium uh, the, the better the term uh, for the investors. And you can also throw in warrant coverage, which was more popular. But these days, uh, oftentimes people would say, oh, um, you can design the conversion discount in a way that delivers the same bargain as you would have gotten if you got the warrant coverage. So it's essentially the same thing, but there are situations where warrant coverage would be better. Uh, but that, that probably goes beyond the scope of this presentation. So legal is uh, a topic that is interesting to me. I'm not sure how interesting it is to you. I want to make it very practical, uh, given we don't have much time. But um, here's the gist of it. Essentially, um, in, in Delaware corporate law, uh, and Delaware is the you know, jurisdiction of choice for a lot of venture back companies, um, if you are a director or an officer, uh, th those are legally defined terms, you are fiduciaries. So what that means is you owe fiduciary duties to the company. Um, and that essentially means you have to act in the best interest of the company and its stockholders. Uh, and, and when you want to go one level down, the duties can be put in one of two buckets. One is the duty of care, 
The other is the duty of loyalty. Uh, the duty of care, pra care, practically speaking, means you got to be diligent. Um, so when you're on the board or in your officer, uh, you have to pay attention, take time, read materials that get circulated, uh, attend meetings, and be, um, you know, make efforts to be involved in major decision making. Um, so that's uh, the, the one, one bucket. The other bucket is the duty of loyalty. And in an easy formulation, I usually call it like, don't steal from your company. So what does that mean? So sometimes you uh, put on multiple hats. So let's say you invested in this company and you are appointed by the investor as a director of the company, in which case you're a director of the company. So you're a fiduciary, but you're also a represent representative of your employer, which is your investor investment firm. So you have multiple hats. Sometimes uh, those duties come into conflict. So duty of loyalty essentially means if you are um, stealing from the company or doing, uh, put, find yourself in a conflict and then um, you do what favors your um, investor, but that harms the interests of the company, then you essentially violated the duty of loyalty. Uh, so that's why it's, it's really important to be able to recognize these conflict situations. If you represent a fund uh, and then you take a board seat of a company, then you uh, have a potential conflict. So let's say um, you invested in a company and the company is trying to do a down round. So down round meaning like the price is depressed. And then as you've seen, like there are a lot of sweeteners the company can give. So in that case, um, you're an investor, right? You represent an investor and, and that investor is interested in participating in this round. So it would be in their interest to add more sweeteners but uh, you're also a fiduciary to the company. And from the perspective of the existing stockholders, uh, throwing out, throwing bunch of sweeteners to new investors is not in the best interest of the company. So that's why uh, as soon as you spot a conflict, you got to address it uh, because otherwise the, it, it can really um, blow back and have, have bad consequences. So to drill down on it a little bit more, um, ultimately then, what happens if I do something wrong um, in a conflict situation, right? So that question is the, essentially the same as how the court would analyze my situation. And the court has two different ways to assess uh, a such situation. One is uh, the business judgment rule and the other is the entire fairness test. So the business judgment rule, if you get in, have the court apply the business judgment rule, you essentially won because what that means is the court would be very differential um, to the, the, the decision made by the business principles. Um, so unless it was wildly irrational or wasteful. Uh, the entire fairness is typically means the burden is on the business principles to prove why the transaction that we did was fair, not only in terms of the price, but also in terms of the process. So your goal is really get to the business judgment rule versus the um, entire fairness. Then uh, the question is, how do you get to the business judgment rule? How do you have the company apply this more lenient test so that you are not in trouble? Um, Delaware courts have uh, provided a couple of ways you can sort of cleanse the conflict or, or you know, these are the measures by which you can get to the business judgment rule. Um, one is to say, hey, like, is your board independent? Uh, and sometimes in venture back companies, uh, you have the board consisting of the founders and investors. And when you're doing a down round, it's often the case that existing investors would participate. So they're not independent because they'll be on both sides. Um, and then you have founders, but let's say management. So if the company doesn't raise this round, they may, the company may go out of business, in which case these founders may lose jobs. So the CEO, for example, is he or she... Uh, uh, independent? Maybe not. So that's a little bit gray. So if you don't have a majority of directors who are clearly independent, uh, one way to cleanse that is to form an independent committee consisting of purely independent directors only. But there's a catch. You can't have an independent committee formed at the end of the process and just rubber stamp the deal. You have to form this independent committee from the very get-go and give them enough information and authority. So oftentimes, you would say the independent committee not only cons should consist of 
um, independent directors, but also they should have access to all the information relating to the deal and have the authority to negotiate and either approve or reject the deal. So oftentimes that's not very viable in, in a venture back board. Um, another way to cleanse the conflict is to go out to the stockholders, but not stockholders who are interested, but uh, stockholders who are disinterested um, and, and try to get a majority of votes, their votes to cleanse the transaction, which is called the majority of the minority vote. So if you check both boxes, obviously it's more, more protective. If you check one, not the other, it's slightly unclear, but it's all facts and circumstances. So if you wanna do the best practice and, and be conservative, you probably want to make sure number one, if there is a conflict and if there is, then you at least wanna do one of these two or both. So sometimes uh, cleansing is not possible. What if uh, uh, there's a company that is owned by you know, founders and investors only. So, and, and more often than not, that's that's the case. In which case, you can't go out and get a majority of minority because there's no disinterested holders. And because there's no independent director, you can't form an independent committee. So what do you do? So you're unfortunately in the entire fairness uh, territory at that time. And then you need to make efforts to create record so that you can prove to the court if necessary that the process and the substance of the transaction were fair entirely fair. So how do you go about it? Like you memorialize market check. So you can say the price was fair because I hired this banker and the banker went out and talked to a number of people and uh, they didn't come back with any any term sheet or they came back with the term uh, term sheet that is not as favorable. That's, that's good. Uh, and you can also uh, get a third party in the M&A context to tell us that the price at which you were trying to sell the company is fair. Um, another interesting tactic is uh, is a rights offering. So this is this doesn't necessarily allow you to go to the business judgment rule, but it's pretty it mitigates the the litigation risk quite a bit. And the gist of it is essentially that um, the, the the problematic scenario is this. Let's say you are in a down round situation. You give a bunch of sweeteners, and then later the company turns a corner, and those sweeteners are. Uh, essentially a windfall, a lot of benefit to those who participated. Uh, so, and then they would have a claim and they can potentially sue the company or the board saying, oh, in hindsight, 2020, like you shouldn't have done it. It was unfair to the stockholders at the time. So what a rights offering does is that, okay, we're in a down round situation. We have to give out a bunch of sweeteners because otherwise the company won't be able to raise money and will go under. So, uh, but we also want to make sure we're protected. So why don't we um, offer the same sweeteners and to all the other investors and see if they're willing to put their money in, right? Uh, so if you passed on it and, and then you would be in a difficult position later on to say, oh, if I would have given an opportunity, I would have participated, right? That, that's a tough argument to make when you actually offered him or her the opportunity to participate with reasonable disclosure and opportunity, but um, they passed on it. So that's one way to mitigate that liquidation, that litigation um, risk. And whatever um, consents and approvals that I'm talking about, it, it doesn't help to say, hey, like approve this transaction right now. And I can't tell you much about it. So that's the worst kind of consent. So that whatever approval or consent we're talking about should be informed. So you need to give them information. So here are the terms and, and all the other kind of relevant material information should be provided. And at the same time, uh, you have like at least a few days to decide versus you have to make the decision right now. I, I don't know if the court would view that as a reasonable opportunity. So that's uh, how you kind of protect the downside here. Sale, there, there is a question on what happens with down rounds for safes. Yeah, that's interesting. So this is more like a, let, let's think of a, a someone who is trying to put money in uh, via safe. Right, and you want to protect yourself from a potential down round in the future, right? So there are like three different forms, if I recall, that are on the YC website, and one is, I believe, like valuation cap only, and then there is a conversion discount only, and there is a form that gives neither but has like most favored nation clause, um, which means if you give more favorable terms to others, then I get the benefit of the same. So here, like. The down round risk, I, I think, is mostly with respect to the uh, first kind, the, the valuation cap only. And here's why. So let's see, say the company just closed around 
and they they their post money valuation is let's say 100 million or something like that uh, and they say oh the next round will likely raise at a much higher valuation um, but i want to give you some benefit so i'll, I'll give you um let you invest in this company via safe with a hundred million dollar valuation cap so uh if the company's value go up then you still get the benefit of hundred million dollar valuation so that sounds like a deal right now uh that was 2021 <laughs> and, and now we have 2022 where the company gets devalued and the company raises another round at 80 million dollars um, of, of valuation so you kind of now think that okay i got $100 million valuation cap, which means I can deem the company valued at $100 million. But this is a, a financing that values a company at a lower price, $80 million. So that doesn't help me. So how can I protect the, uh, against that kind of risk? Is to add a uh, conversion discount as well. So conversion discount is not mutually exclusive uh, with a conversion cap. So you can set conversion cap at $100 million. That's sort of an upside protection. When the company does well, then I want to make sure that it's not valued over 100 million for the purposes of calculating my conversion price. But in addition, I want a conversion discount, a flat discount of, let's say, 25%. Uh, and that 25% would apply to the price per share at which you're selling shares in the next round. So let's say we're um, in that same situation, uh, $80 million pre-money financing. Uh, you obviously are not going to convert at the um, $100 million valuation cap, because that's going to give you less shares. Uh, now you have the second prong, which is 25% discount from the price per share at 80. So 80 discounted by 25% would be the valuation, and then you would convert into that number of shares, which give you more shares. So uh, it used to be very popular that you have both. Um, and I, I think it's a product of good times that you know YC essentially pulled that form that provided both from their website, but you can always throw that in. And so uh, one way you can protect against the future down round is to essentially say, oh, I want a valuation cap as an upside protection, but I also want um, you know, conversion discount um, on top of it. And then like, if you are afraid that someone will come along and say, oh, uh, I know you gave this guy a $100 million valuation cap, but I want to give you more money. Or now you need more money. Now you need money more. So I'm I'm not okay with hundred million. I I'm, I want uh, my safe to have a fifty million dollar valuation cap, which is more favorable. So in that case, you know you feel like oh I gave you more money. I, I gave you money at an earlier stage. At that time you were doing okay. So all I got was a hundred million dollar cap safe. But you gave fifty million dollar cap safe in the future. But then you feel like you missed out on something. So if you want to protect against that kind of risk, you throw in the MFN clause. So MFN is essentially most favored nation. So if you give better rights to future holders, then you can essentially swap out your existing safe for the new version of the safe. So you get the benefit of, in my case, $50 million conversion cap. So I'm sure there are a bunch of other risks that you can think of, and it depends on what risk you focus on. And then that will drive the discussion of what kind of protective measure that I have to include in my current safe. I don't know if that answered your question, but that, that's probably what I would say on that. Okay, thanks, Sale. Hi, so can, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, just, just regarding um, your comment about 2022 and having no IPO and being down round, um, based on your vantage point, which uh, likely you're, you see a lot of movements on your side, I don't quite understand why 2022, there isn't any IPO events. In From the perspective, I've heard many, um, reasoning or, or quasi excuses one would be you know ukraine russia another would be inflation but from the united states perspective uh, my given the infusion of cash the government has given to u.s citizens in particular um i found that uh you know the, my hypothesis is that the folks in the united states are actually even more rich more more wealthy than they were in 2021 or 2020 right so um there's there seems to be this uh, this dichotomy or this missing bridge that i'm not seeing as to why 2022, there are such down rounds in the United States. Uh, what's your what's your thought on that? So uh, full disclosure, I'm not a capital markets or IPO expert, so uh, take it with a grain of salt. But I, I will share my perspective. So when I work with investors um, and and see like why would you or why wouldn't you invest, um, a lot of it depends on uncertainty. Um, so when you're looking at the stock market right now, 
uh, you know, if, if you know that this is how it's going to be for the next like two, three years, uh, and, and there's no unpredictability or uncertainty, you can price anything, right? Maybe it's a down round, maybe it's an up round, you can price it. But at this point, people are just wondering, in my view, um, oh, how the market would change, how, where the interest rate is headed, right, in the next six months or a year, where is inflation, right, and all that stuff. And people are still trying to uh, grasp, like, what's, what the future holds. And nothing kills a deal like uncertainty, in, in my experience. So um, that, that's how I view um, from venture perspective, but uh, it could be different in, in the public market. But one thing I would note is inflation and interest rate hikes, and those things are not very helpful. So for example, like buyout firms, right? They, a lot of PE buyouts happen on a, you know, with, with debt, right? But then debt gets more and more expensive as you have these you know, interest hikes. So that's why the you know, exit is not happening by buyouts as much, is my understanding. And obviously the IPO, the public market, they always look around and look at the stock price and it's all over the map, right? So it's unpredictable, which I, I, I think is the, is the reason, if you ask me. Yeah, I think so. I think it's also partly because the risk-free rate is not zero anymore. Um, it's basically with the Fed hike, the cost of capital isn't zero as it has been for the last 10 years. <laughs> and so when you're actually valuing the company, you're discounting the future cash flows and the denominator is actually not one anymore. So the, the valuation is lower and so selling, they're wondering whether they could get a higher valuation in the future if the rates drop. And, and when, when I talk to venture investors focusing on tech or early stage or growth stage, they often look at the revenue or the multiples or some, some way of, you know, valuing the company. More and more you get closer to, uh, in my experience, the public stock market, they always try to find a comparable company in the public market. And as you can imagine, the stock price is down. So if you kind of take go with that method, your valuation will come down because the comparable company that's out there on NASDAQ, uh, their stock price just tanked. Right. So that really impacts your later stage companies. But early stage, they, they don't really have a ready, a readily comparable uh, company because they're very far uh, in terms of like growth stage. So that may be why early stage and growth stage uh, are less impacted than pre IPO stage. That's super helpful. Thank you so much, you too. If, if nothing else, I, I, I can say one word uh, as my closing remark, which is uh, now is not the time to panic. Um, although, like people say many different things. The emerging companies venture capital market, especially early to growth stage, is still doing better than 2020. So if you, it's all all about who, which year or which time you compare yourself to. But if you compare it to 2021, which was a gangbuster year, then you know things don't look so good. But if you compare it to 2020, then things are actually up uh, based on the numbers. The only thing that I would say is the IPOs are not happening. So uh, as you can imagine, that impacts pre-IPO companies or later stage company more so than tech companies in early stage, growth stage. Thank you so much again, Sale. Uh, pleasure to have you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thanks again for joining us today.